uh, now I will introduce uh, Dr. Yasser Zarlul. Uh, he's a consultant and anesthetist and intensive care of medicine, uh, Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Abu Zab. Um, he's talked about uh, challenges in the controversy in acute post-operative pain. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, as you see, I will talk about some topics in post-operative pain. Uh, actually, I am asking uh, questions and you may help us and help myself to answer these questions. I uh, just will open some windows or some doors for some important topic in the post-operative B. So we have so many challenges. One of them, opioid induced hyperalgesia, opioid tolerance. Patient may need chronic use of opioid post-operative the patient may need long-term opioid therapy as well, or he came already in opioid therapy. Patient with special needs, like patient with cerebral palsy, patient with dementia, patient with a stroke, or this patient, we can't communicate with them how to evaluate and how to manage the pain. This is one of the challenges. Substance abuse, also patient may be in cocaine, heroin, benzodiazepine, alcohol. So how to deal with this patient during the perioperative period? Patient with psychotic disorder, we don't know exactly he is in pain or no. Patient with hepatic and renal failure and the side effects of the opioids or other analgesic medication. Extreme of age, we may have very premature baby, we may just a few days coming for emergency surgery and you want to provide analgesia for them. Or on the other hand, you may be 90 or 100 years old the patient and he need analgesia for any type of surgery. Now, morbid obesity is increasing and I have a lot of patients coming for bariatric surgery and they may be need uh, CPAP for obstructive sleep apnea. Again, if you are giving opioids, this may affect their breathing. Regional anesthesia, anticoagulant, rebound the pain after regional anesthesia, local anesthesia, toxicity, anesthesia, nociception index, this is an index to measure the been severity during the surgery or in recovery room. Enhanced recovery after surgery and the pain management, you may need to discharge the patient very quick from the hospital and the persistent post-surgical pain. So as you see, you have around 16 problems and you maybe have more and you have to deal with all of this. Again, I'm just opening some doors or some window to explain some point. It is difficult to discuss all issue but uh, we will see what we can do. First here, there is recent uh, change in the definition of pain, which is published in September last month of this year. This is about the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So it is summarized shorter than the previous definition. So you have actual or potential tissue damage, this causing unpleasant sensory or emotional experience. And the problem that with pain, it is usually underestimated and it is more common with severe pain. So this underestimation will lead to the under treatment. Actually, the underestimation of pain may start from the anesthesiologist themselves. Here, when the School of Anesthesia started in Chicago in uh, 1018-96, they have to qualify instructors, not a physician. So you they will give diploma for the instructors, and this is the topic they are going to study to be an anesthesiologist or an instructor in anesthesia. Physiology and anatomy, chemistry, art and the science of anesthesia, a little bit strange term, but it is maybe anesthesia psychology and the hypnotism. Hypnotism during this time to induce hypnosis or sleeping by non-pharmacological methods. Then this something is very strange. Forces of life, phrenology, physiognomy, temperament, and Jersey policy. So what all these five, I welcome very quick about that. Forces of need uh, of life, four things, needs, self-esteem, over uh, ownership and emotions. Phrenology, this is the study of the size of head. Suppose that every area in this head may indicate some character or mental abilities. 
And physiognomy, it is a person, facial features. You have to study the facial features. This may give you, and the expression may give you some idea about the patient's personality as well. And after that, the individual difference in behavior. And the last topic is the, to study the law. And as you see, there is no, nothing about pain. About 10 topics you have to study, but nothing about pain. Come now to the physiological effect of the unrelieved pain. As you see, unrelieved pain may affect all the system of the body. In the crime, all the uh, hormones will be increased, except the testosterone will decrease. We have GIT effect, respiratory, cardiovascular, uh, genitourinary, behavior, and immune. All the system is affected by unrelieved pain. And recently, regarding the cardiovascular effect of post-operative pain is associated with myocardial injury after non-cardiac anesthesia. That means severe pain or unrelieved pain in non-cardiac surgery will cause myocardial injury. They found that in this study, around 3,000 patients and the myocardial injury happened in 4.5% of the patient by increased the troponin, and this occurs within 72 hours of surgery. And the higher pain score, the higher risk of myocardial injury, and the conclusion that high pain score within 72 hours of surgery may increase the myocardial injury. So it is one of the important issue to control the pain after surgery. Another problem, the change of behavior with unrelieved pain. Another study about the post-operative delirium and the risk, how to reduce this risk, they found that perioperative pain in, may be associated with up to three times higher risk of post-operative delirium. So it is not only the myocardial injury, but post-operative delirium as well. And it was suggested that multimodal opioid sparing analgesia this with regular use of paracetamol and the non-steroidal, if there is no contraindication, this minimizes the post-operative delirium. And of course, all the major surgery, you have to consider regional anesthesia, plexus block, nerve block, or neuroaxial anesthesia. So this is the main two problems, myocardial injury and the post-operative delirium. How to predict the patient coming for surgery and he may develop post-operative pain? This study is a little bit old, but it's still valid. In anxiety, depression, preoperative pain, young age, type of surgery, and the female patient. All of them, this is uh, predictors of post-operative pain and the higher uh, analgesic consumptions. So you have to identify these predictors for better management of pain. In a huge study in Germany, these more than 22,000 patients in all post-operative pain, again, it is like the previous study, the pre-operative chronic pain, young age, female patient, this is a predictor of post-operative pain. To come more scientific, and uh, they doing what is named quantitative sensory testing. This to test the patient's sensation before surgery to predict the post-operative pain. How we are doing that? Test the skin, mucosa, and the muscle tissues by applying heat, cold, pressure, pin break, vibration, or electric current. And you have to measure the pain, this by a special machine, of course, before and after application of pain. As you see here, they can apply temperature change, pressure, pin prick, and all is processed by a special machine to translate this stimulation to electrical stimulation and to see if the patient is sensitive to pain or he may develop post-surgical pain or no. So what they found, there is good association in some surgery and no association with other surgery. That means if the quantitative test is positive, so it can predict the pain in orthopedic surgery, abdominal surgery, and the carbon tunnel. But in another type of surgery, like limb imputation, breast cancer, there is no association between the preoperative test and the postoperative pain. Lumbar discectomy and the thoracic surgery, there is maybe equal. Some patients may have association, other patients, no. 
So still we need huge good study to translate this quantitative test to the clinical practice. Another challenge is for enhanced recovery after surgery. In this uh, center, they are doing total hip and the total knee surgery as a day case surgery. You can imagine that patient is coming for total knee or total hip as a day case. But of course, there is a strict selection of the patient and the strict pain relief or analgesia protocol to can match this need. For example, they start the preoperative patient education about the pain and the option and to give paracetamol, gabapentin, cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor, corticosteroids, anti-emetic or opioid. All this given preemptive before starting of the surgery. Of course, and good selection of the patient according to the physical status of the patient and according to special clinical criteria. Anyway, in short, they will start the pain relief preemptive, preoperative. Then after that, they have to choice between regional or general anesthesia, no choice, and the local infiltration, analgesia infiltration of the wound, or maybe single shot of the nerve block. Anyway, we have ERAS. We have to match the need of ERAS and try to discharge your patient in the same day by excellent pain relief. Now we have some challenging cases, 71 years old man with senile dementia. That's mean he is not communicating. He may can't express himself or herself about the pain. Hypertensive and the patient developed left hip fractures. And now this patient is coming for anesthesia and the most operative pain relief. I am not answering these cases, just giving you imagination and to see the option in our mind. Another patient, 69 years old, stroke six years ago. So he has right hemiplegia, aphasic, coronary artery disease, diabetes type 2, hypertension, coronary kidney disease stage 3. And the patient has perforated DU, septic protonitis, and coming for a laboratory. The problem with perforated DU, the patient has abdominal pain a few days back. But maybe the family or relatives are not aware about there is something going inside his abdomen. That's why he came for laparotomy. Patient coming in severe pain and he need post-operative pain control as well. And he is a physic and not communicating well how to control his pain, this is another problem. Now we will come to the opioids. Opioids may causing at the moment medical and social problems. So are opioids should be used for all the patient in general anesthesia? Of course, some. Uh, uh, surgery, maybe superficial surgery or surgery don't need invasive anesthesia technique, you don't need opioids. But the question that still is opioid need in all patients coming for general anesthesia? Actually, they found that in the United States, 130 American people die every day from opioid overdose. Either this from drug abuse in street use of heroin or cocaine, or if the patient in home and they have some tablet of morphine or another opioids and he takes a tablet, so causing is this. And this report from the Center of Controlled Disease in the United States. Why the patient have a lot of opioids in home? Because the over prescriptions of opioids after surgery. Maybe this usually by the junior surgeon. The anesthesiologist is not involved in the prescription of the post-operative opioids in home. So maybe some of the junior surgeons over prescribing the opioid. Why this happened? This because they don't know how many tablets needed by the patient after discharge and to satisfy the patient as well. So they write the pill just in case they need it. So what is the result of that? You will, you will have good surprise of that. For example, if the patient have laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the physician prescribes 30 tablets, but the patient is using six or seven tablets only. For laparoscopic colectomy, it is the same. The physician prescribed 40 tablets, but the patient used six or seven tablets only. It is more evident with the uh, patient coming for thyroid, prescribing 30 tablets, and the patient used one or two tablets. So where is the difference of all these tablets where? It is a big store in the home. 
So if, for example, one of the family have suicide tendency, it is very easy to pick up the tablet and to causing suicide or overdose. If some children is playing in the home and they find the tablet, so they will find it. That's why this number, one thirty of the patient of the Americans die every day from the opioid overdose. Now, opioid have another problem for the opioid induced hyperangesia. This is because the high dose of intraoperative opioids. This is a patient has high postoperative pain and not responding to the usual doses of morphine, fentanyl, so fentanyl or betadine or oxycodone, any postoperative pain killer. And of course, because of this high postoperative pain, the consumption of the opioid of morphine is increased in during the first 24 hours. And this is extremely important to differentiate between the tolerance and hyperalgesia. In tolerance, lack of response, the patient has partial response. Before you give five milligram of morphine and the patient responding well. But now five milligram of morphine not causing good pain relief. You need to give 10 for good pain relief. So you will increase the dose to control the pain and the reason for that decrease sensitivity of opioid. In hyperalgesia, there is increased sensitivity to painful stimuli. That's why if you are giving opioids, the patient will have more pain, and this because of the sensitivity in, uh, uh, for pain. So tolerance versus hyperalgesia, you have to differentiate between them. Again, what is the main reasons of high intraoperative opioids? It is very common the patient has tachycardia and hypertension due to the surgical stimulation. So automatically, you will give some opioids to control this hypertension and the tachycardia. And the highest incidence with remifentanil. So, so if you are sure 100% the depth of anesthesia is okay, and the patient has adequate proper doses of opioids, whatever the opioid you are using, you have to use sympathetic medication like ismolol, labitolol, clonidine, or dexamethamidine to control the hemodynamic response. Again, I have to stress, you should be sure about the level of analgesia and the level of anesthesia before doing that. Generally, we may have diminished response to opioid because of the main three reasons. Tolerance and hyperalgesia, as I explained, and increase uh, for pain. The cause of tolerance is receptor desensitization, and you can solve this problem with opioid escalation, long-acting opioids, and non-opioids. Of course, non-opioids used in most of the type of the patient, either regular paracetamol or regular non-steroid. Hyperalgesia, as we explained, sensitization of the primary afferent neurons, this is the cause of hyperalgesia. And you can control that by something like ketamine, long-acting opioids, or opioid rotations. You can use morphine or betadine or fentanyl or sofentanyl, so you have rotation. Increased pain may be the patient more tissue damage or more progress of the disease, or the patient may develop the neuropathic pain. So you have to do also opioid escalations, non-opioids, if non-neuropathic uh, pain, you have to control it. So this is the main reason, three reason for diminished response to opioids. One of the problem for pain, how you are monitoring or measure pain. Usually we depend on the autonomic changes, but we don't have a direct measure of, measure of pain. It is not like the muscle relaxant, you can check the nervous stimulator or EEG, you can uh, measure the level of anesthesia by bispectral index. So if you can't measure it, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. If you can't control it, you can't improve it. So if you can't measure the pain, you can't improve the pain. We need something to measure the pain intraoperatively. Until now, we don't have something to be used everyday clinical practice. But it was suggested that nociception, anti-nociception balance monitoring by monitoring the nociception level index. This depends on the autonomic changes. It's photo, but skin conductance, temperature, motion, and also the hemodynamic changes. And we have score from zero to 100, like by spectral index exactly. From zero, no pain, 100 is maximum pain. 
And this is a little bit more specific than the hemodynamic changes and allow you for titration of the opioid according to the uh, portions you need. Again, it is like by spectral index, you are titrating the anesthesia according to the piece index. And the routine use of uh, this nociception monitoring in the future is not clear yet because some drugs not matching this index well. For example, they found that patient with nitrous oxide may be the patient in pain, but it is not reflecting on the index. So the effect of each energetic drug on this nociception level index, it is not clear yet. Now, because of the problem of the opioids, we have a recently published uh, guidelines, international guidelines about the opioid related harm in adult surgical patients. The good point in this guidelines or in this statement, they depend on the modifiable to modify some risk factors. It is total 10 recommendations. Of course, I will not explain all, just I am telling you what is running now. And they have pre-assessment clinics, three factors can be changed. Post-operative is patient still in the hospital, five factors. Preparation for discharge before going to home, four factors. Most charge in home four factors. So we have 10 recommendations. I will explain three or four only of them, but you can refer to the reference to read all total of them. This is the whole factors which can be modified to minimize the use of opioids. The first is three preoperative. If the patient has preoperative opioid, you have to try to win or to minimize the use of the opioid before surgery. Because as we mentioned, most of the study found that any patient in chronic opioid preoperatively, they will have persistent post-surgical pain and higher opioid use. And something extremely important now, psychoeducation. Because patient with anxiety or depression usually have more exaggerated pain or patient with catastrophic thinking, I will explain this now. Also, if you... you so they didn't approach them well before the surgery, they will have severe post-operative pain. And education about the pain management, we have nerve block, we have plexus block, we have neuroaxial block, we have BCE. So you have to explain all this to your patients. The one post-operative, I will explain it because it is also important to minimize the opioid use. This about the functional activity scale. Usually, we depend on the pain score to assist the patient from zero to one. So, if, for example, from zero to 10, if the patient has a score seven or eight, I will give opioids. Actually, you have to assist the functional activity as well. If the patient can move or no, what is the limitation of movement? For example, patient with moderate pain and his pain score is seven or six. All right, but there is no limitation of movement or mild limitation. So I can give non-opioid analgesia. But of course, if severe pain and significant limitation, I will give opioids. In short, if you combine both the pain score with the functional activity scale, this will limit or minimize the use of the opioids. We'll come to answer the questions about the opioids for general anesthesia. It's still very useful and can reduce some state of coma for anesthesia and control the unwanted effect of autonomic nervous system in response for nociception. But again, you have to focus in the more conservative use of the opioid. So it's still playing an important role in general anesthesia. Now we will come to the multimodal analgesia. Everybody is aware about the component of the multimodal analgesia, but is it working or no? We will see now. I have another patient, 11 years old girl. She came for with cerebral palsy, developmental delay, scissor disorders, and she came for correction of the kyphoscoliosis. So uh, a major spinal surgery. And how we will manage this post-operative pain in this patient, actually, it was extremely difficult, but it is one of our patients. Another patient, 29 years old man, drug abuse, he is using cocaine, benzodiazepine, and alcohol, and he had bed strain traffic accident, and he developed fracture right radius, right ulna, and right knee as well, and the fracture of right tibia. 
how to give anesthesia and to manage the post-operative pain in patient on cocaine, this another great challenge actually. So I will ask a major question. Is the multimodal analgesia working or no? In this recent study, spine surgery, they are using paracetamol, gabapentin, ketamine, lignocaine, and the post-operative acetaminophen, gabapentin, and opioid. What they found didn't improve the recovery of the patient. And what is more important, they stopped the study early because of the futility of this study. So multimodal analgesia by this combination is not working in spine surgery. Maybe spine surgery is a major surgery, very extensive pain, but this combination is not working in the uh, spine surgery. Another major question about the gabapentoids, and because a lot of physicians using it for post-operative acute pain, and because importance, it is on the front page of the anesthesiology journal in August of this year. Again, what they found, meta-analysis, 281 trials, more than 24,000 patients, and no clinical significant energetic effect of perioperative gabapentin or gabapentoids, and no effect on the post-operative chronic pain and the greater risk of the adverse event. So the conclusion of this major meta-analysis, gabapentoids has no role in acute post-operative pain. And if you are using it, you should stop it. Actually, it is from personal experience, a lot of dizziness, a lot of sedation, and there is no relief of pain. So gabapentoids, have no role in acute pain management. Maybe in neuropathic pain, it's okay. And maybe last month as well, in patients with chronic pelvic pain, gabapentoids has no effect in controlling the pain. And it is expensive drug, by the way. Now, we added another uh, option for the multimodal analgesia, nar pharmacological, by the psychoeducation. As we saw earlier, patients with severe depression with severe, or patients with an, uh, an anxiety have more pain. So this preoperative psychoeducation may reduce the pain. We have two types of psychoeducation. Preemptive before the patient coming for surgery and the preventive throughout the whole perioperative period. For example, postoperative patient developed the pain. Why he developed the pain, we can explain for him. And what is your option to change the drug or to use another technique. So psychomedulation is a good technique. And also the patient with catastrophic effect or catastrophizing defined as negative mental state during actual or anticipated pain. And this one of the most important psychological predictors of pain. The patient usually expects the worst. He is mild surgery or minor surgery, and he's expecting very severe pain. So this patient needs psychomedulation. And all the meta-analysis of the study found that 55% preoperative anxiety and the pain catastrophizing thickening associated with greater pain up to three months post-operative. So again and again, adding psychomedulation or psychoeducation for the multimodal analgesia effective in patients with anxiety and depression. Now, this is the puzzle of the multimodal analgesia. You have ketamine, non-steroidal, cholinidine, infiltration of the wound by local anesthetic, magnesium sulfate, gabapentoids excluded, regional anesthesia, lignocaine, parastamol. We have a missed piece here. What do you think? I can't hear. Okay. Do you think cannabis may be the missed piece in this puzzle? We will see this meta-analysis, which is published this month. Analgesic efficacy of cannabinoids for acute pain management. This systemic review and the meta-analysis, no clinical effect from cannabis. Actually, many countries may, uh, still use cannabis or some extraction of the cannabis for acute pain management. But after this meta-analysis, no clinical important benefits from cannabis or its derivatives. And it increases the post-operative pain and may cause hypotension as well. The last point in my lecture about the regional anesthesia. Does regional anesthesia improve the outcome? All of us now doing peripheral nerve block, plexus block, neuroaxial block, 
But this change or translated to the change in the long uh, term outcome or no, actually no. Of course, there is good benefits, but this short term benefits translated to long term or no until now low, especially in the orthopedic surgery. And because of this controversy, we have maybe six days ago, seven questions for seven regional anesthesiologists in the United States. And the question that neuroaxial approach, nerve block may be superior medical outcome and a better pain management. Despite we have some evidence, the superiority of nerve block of original anesthesia is still not used too much and there may be some barriers to implant it. So they asked these questions for the seven anesthesiologists. I will explore two answers only because of the time. The first answer from Nabil Kasabani from Philadelphia, we live in academic bubble and the reality of practice may or may not reflect the evidence that we have. I like the term academic bubble, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, the second answer from the uh, Rebecca Johnson from Mayo Clinic, and, and she mentioned that imperfection within the available regional anesthesia outcome research studies. So one mentions that we live in academic bubble and the other one imperfection of the study. So to use regional anesthesia or not to use, it is a matter of controversy, as you see. So why the research is not translated to the clinical practice? The answer is 17 years. This means you may have 17 years delay from doing the research until translating it to the clinical practice every day. Why these reasons? We have seven reasons. You are not aware about the guidelines. These guidelines are already published, but you are not aware about it. You are aware about the guidelines, but are, you are not familiar with the technique. You are not familiar with the details of these guidelines. Lack of agreement, you, don't, uh, you are not agree for this recommendation. My practice is better. Self-efficacy, I don't think this will do work. Maybe no change. Lack outcome expectancy, I am doing the same technique since a long time. Why it, uh, I change it? It is inertia as well. External barriers, for example, now ultrasound, you need extens uh, expensive machine. So it is difficult to get machine for each room or each uh, operating room. So we have external barriers. Anyway, the translation of research to clinical practice may take up to 17 years and there is seven barriers may cause this. Actually, when we have a basic research, you have to do human research and then clinical research. After the clinical research is proved, you will translate it to the guidelines and from guidelines to the clinical practice. The main delay or main translations occur at two stages, from the basic research to the human research and from clinical research to the guidelines. So this may take a longer time. Another problem with regional anesthesia is the rebound the pain. This may increase the opioid analgesic and decrease the patient satisfaction. You may ask why the rebound the pain. I don't know some of you hear about the rebound the pain or no. Actually, they found that the incidence after peripheral nerve block is around 40%. And still a challenge or big questions. But we have many reasons for rebound the pain. Either abnormal specific nerve fibers, spontaneous hyperactivity, patient factor, surgery factor, anesthesia factor. For the abnormal specific nerve fiber, spontaneous activity, C fibers, hyperactivity, and hyperexcitability may happen. Patient factor, as we mentioned before, preoperative vein, young age, female patient, anxiety, and depression. Surgery related factors, continuous firing of pain signals leading to the hyperalgesia and oligenia. And the last point, anesthesia-related factors due to the reversible toxicity by the local anesthetic to the nerve fibers, this may cause a problem. So I have a lot of rebound uh, pain after peripheral nerve block. You have to try to control it when you are considering nerve block or plexus block to your patients. How to minimize it? You can add fibronorphine, dexamethasone, or recently, or colinidine, or dexamethomidine to the nerve block to minimize the uh, rebound pain after block. 
The last case, 39 years old lady, and eight days ago, she had bariatric surgery because of the morbid obesity. His uh, BMI was 49. She has obstructive sleep apnea, and she is in CPAP. After eight days, she came with severe pain and signs of symptoms of sepsis. CT abdomen was contrast, so it leaked from the anastomosis at the stomach. So she is for diagnostic laparoscopy. Laparoscopy was very difficult, so it was changed to laparotomy, and you have to control the pain of this patient post-operative. What is your option? It is a big question. Because the problem with the post-operative uh, communication in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, they found that frequent death and the brain damage if the patient is not received supplemental oxygen and there is no respiratory monitoring, and if you combine opioid with insensitive drugs, this may cause death and the brain damage most operative in patient with sleep apnea. So most of us, including myself actually, satisfy ourselves by inserting the caster in the epidural space, injecting the local anesthetic around the nearby ultrasound, controlling the immediate post-operative pain without looking for the short or long-term outcome of their technique. Epidural space. Epidural is very common now. And most of us believe that epidural is a good option in major surgery, especially in thoracic abdominal surgery and the major lower limb surgery. And here, the review about the thoracic epidural, there is a lot of benefit. Better analgesia, less complication pulmonary, mechanical ventilation, we don't need it too much. Post-operative ileus is less. Reduce the post-operative protein catapolis, and the patient mobility will be better, especially in patients with multiple refractions. But they found recently that after meta-analysis that there is no difference in the pulmonary event or the, even the cardiovascular event. So you will use thoracic epidural for colonic surgery or no, it's still a, a big problem. Tomorrow you will use it, I am sure, yeah. But meta-analysis that no difference in mortality, no difference in pulmonary event, no difference in the cardiovascular event as well. Come now to the big surprise. Epidural analgesia will established in obstetric since more 30 or four years. And all the obstetric units have epidural service for 24 hours. So what they found is higher incidence of eutism in the patient who is receiving, for the children, of course, the baby, eutism for the persons who is using epidural. If no epidural uh, during normal vaginal delivery, there is no eutism or eutism is minimal, 1.3. The increasing the hour of epidural in the patient who is coming for normal delivery increase the incidence of eotism in the children up to 3% if the epidural stay more than eight hours. So tomorrow you will give epidural for the patient coming of normal vaginal delivery or no, I'm sure you will do. Another problem, fever with patient with epidural is around 12% and without epidural once 3%. What is the cause of eotism in patient who is receiving, uh, sorry, in the children of the patient coming for the normal vaginal delivery under epidural analgesia, it is not clear yet, but it happened. So in general, this is the last point in my lectures. Most of the anesthesiology practice and the most guidelines are not driven by high quality medical evidence. That's why we have a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion. So in conclusion, still we have a lot of challenges of post-operative pain and the multimodal analgesia or maybe free analgesia, may, uh, opioid free analgesia is still uh, standard, but which combination, for which surgery, for which patient, we don't know. And regional anesthesia is usually a good choice, but rebound the pain and the effect of long-term outcome is not clear yet. And thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Yasser. Have a questions or no questions? Yes, you yeah, we have a question, Dr. Yasser. Thank you too much. 
Uh, I know the time is maybe not. Uh, uh, Doctor Yasser, I have a question. No, I, I, I see Doctor Amman want to tell some comment. <laughs> no question. Concerns <laughs> more than you. I have a question, Doctor Yasser. Can I ask you a question? Okay, Ammar, any comment, Ammar? Uh, one, one of our colleagues is commenting. Please go ahead, sir. Dr. Yasser. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Dr. Yasser, uh, what is the message uh, from your lecture about, uh, you, know, you know that we are not a researcher, what a clinician. So when you speak to me about the research, sometimes it's not implicated about the clinical, when you speak about regional anesthesia, when you speak about post operative pain. From your lecture, some of our junior understands there is no difference to do or not to do. And this is a very important issue, transmitted to me. So what's your comment? في صدى صوت في حد فتح موبايل وكمبيوتر مع بعض نفضل لكم تفضل دكتور ياسر yeah actually as I mentioned I am not going to answer some questions I just open the door some questions and because I have a lot as you see most of the articles in this year or maybe last few years actually my original lecture is not like that but during the last few weeks I found a lot of articles that's against our practice so that's why uh, Dr. Muhammad, want to start? Okay. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Take it. Okay, okay. To highlight some point, to focus some point, and to help every anesthesiologist facing the same problem to find the proper answer to all the questions. Dr. Yasser, Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Yasser, how are you? Yeah. Go ahead, I have, Go. Yes, I have, I have one comment, Dr. Yasser, if you please, and I have one question. My comment, as you mentioned in your lecture, that uh, uh, the, the use of the opioid, it may uh, uh, lead to a lot of uh, complication, and we are using uh, a lot of uh, doses intraoperative uh, related to the opioid. So uh, the problem in the post-operative, period, I think it is not related to the anesthesiologist, as you said. Some of the juniors yeah, yeah, of the right, surgeon, right, yeah, yes. some of the surgeons, the, the, the junior surgeons, they are uh, prescribing all the time PCA. And since then, this invention of the PCA was morphine or fentanyl or any uh, opioid post-operative and extends for more than three days. Uh, since the, the, the invention of this technique, it is very bad because I, from the surgeon themselves, that the PCA itself, it, uh, uh, it leads to one of the most complication cases, the post-operative nausea and vomiting. It is very, very offensive, rather than uh, treat the pain post-operatively. And it may, the patient may need only an non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory 